So in, in 2012, you mixed the Smashing Pumpkins album, Oceania. Hopefully I'm not butchering all these album names. And uh, I, I hadn't been listening to the Smashing Pumpkins in, in a while. And I remember that album coming out. I didn't have huge expectations. And I remember being blown away that it, it was... I, I thought it was one of their best albums in a long time. And critically, it was considered a return to form for the band. Um, the album sounds great. I, I guess my question is, when you're just mixing an album for a band, do do they show up in the studio and and are there for the mixing and, and have their input? Or do they just kind of get the final product? You say, what do you think? And they go, oh, I'd like guitars louder here and there. Or is it different for every band? It's normally different, but these days, um, especially when I mix at home, people tend to send things to me and I send back my first draft, get revisions from them and we refine it from there. Uh, with the case of, <clears throat> sorry, with the case of uh, both uh, Elegy and Oceania, um, I went to Billy's studio in, in just outside Chicago. And in fact, the Oceania was so much fun because uh, it was on, still on tape. The guitars were on tape. The drums and bass were on, or no, I think the bass was on tape. The drums were on Pro Tools. And I think the key, some keyboards were on Pro Tools, but all the guitars were on tape. Now, he didn't have a console big enough for all those inputs. So we actually had an old EMI console for a, a very old kind of beatle sound for the drums on one track. We had... Uh, a Neve console. We had a Trident A series console about around behind me. And then we had uh, a Helios that we kind of put it all into. And this is a totally analog, totally performance mix thing. So there wasn't any like, well, recalling. And I said to Billy at the beginning, I said, look, you know, if you want me to mix this way, I'm happy to, but know that we're not going to be able to do a recall where, uh, you know, we just tweak one little thing and then print it again it's not going to be exactly the same because i'm performing it as we go in fact i had to turn switches on and off because of the noise levels of everything so it was really full on i was able to bring things down into subgroups so i had a little set of 24 subgroups that i could mix with but that was it right it wasn't so wasn't as easy to sort of do a full-on full-on recall billy said i never do recalls he said if i don't like the mix i'll just do it again so i thought okay this is good so I started off the mix. I built the first song and I got it and I got it done and I printed it. It was all printed down onto half inch tape. And so uh, I did the mix and I brought Billy in and said, come and listen to see what you think. This is the first, first project that we, we'd done together. And he listened. He's like, yeah, it's pretty good. I don't know. There's kind of something missing, in, you know, in a certain area. And I said, and I thought maybe the guitar solo was, was maybe a bit loud. And I said, I turned to him and said, well, do you think maybe the guitar solo is a bit loud? And he looked at me without a shred of irony and said, Guitar solo was never too loud. That's without, such a without any thing joke. To say. Exactly. So anyway, I, it ended up just being like, you know what? I'll let me do another pass. So I did another pass, and I basically took the rhythm guitars and the body of the guitars, filled them out, and brought them up a little bit. And he brought them back in. He's going, "Yeah, that's my band. Great." And that was it. That was that was the essence of it. And every other mix I did, there was maybe one or two little things, but he was very happy with it. And actually, in the last sort of twenty years, it's one of my most fun mixing projects to ever do. It sounds sounds complex with all the different uh, equipment, but it was great. It was a lot. It was so much fun because it was really these days. I don't get to do performance mixes that much, you know, because bands always want to have, you know, like okay, well, or, or labels or whoever. Yeah, can you do that again? But turn the vocal up here between bar twenty five and thirty five up by two dB, and then you know writing this at this point it's like okay you know but so you don't get to have that just sort of vibe kind of performance mix going on i understand it from the standpoint and i have you know my mixing studio is you know you can see it's not full of consoles and faders and stuff like that because you just end up getting the requests from clients to do minute detail changes so you have to do it in the box so we're up to Stone Sour in your discography, House of Gold and Bones, part one and part two. It's crazy. It's already been a decade. It feels like those albums didn't come out that long ago. Um, did you did you guys know from the start that this would be a two part project? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it was it was it was booked out as being that thing. So and they were going to be a, a year apart that that they were released or that they were released. Yeah, we recorded it all at the same time. Oh, OK. See that yeah. stuff that we don't know as as fans. Oh yeah, no, we 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 recorded the whole project 
all uh, and mixed it all in in one uh they they mixed it down in one go you know so, so we have a, a fan question so this is cam hudson from montreal who sent in the question about the coheed so he had a two-part question uh cory taylor seems to change up his voice from one project to the next so that each one is distinct um what was it like working with such a powerhouse vocalist so oh, pretty pretty open-ended question cory's amazing cory cory you know cory's neck is really thick Right. And so he's got power in his vocal cords, really strong power and incredible passion. I mean, his backstory is amazing, right? That he's homeless for some points of time. People in his life have come and gone in terrible ways. And I mean, he's 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 a remarkable human being to have come out of, you know, the, the world that he has and, and to be as strong. You know, I loved working with him. He was he was a joy uh, just as a person. Uh, to be around and and to work with and like i said in the studio we set him up like it was it was like a big tent but we called it his yurt you know and he had all the whole environment inside was was all set up it was for isolation but it was also for you know creative creative an environment that he's that he's happy with so someone else that's worked with Corey Taylor is producer Jay Rustin, also worked yep. with Coheed and Fall Out Boy. He says David is an amazing producer and a great guy. We finally met in person and we clicked immediately. Yeah, so that's that's Jay. Jay's Jay's awesome. Yeah, great guy, and he did a great job on that mix of that album for sure. So we're we're coming up to the last fifteen minutes. We're going to dive into uh, make music matter. Uh, I had three more artists. I had Rush, the Tea Party, and Mastodon. Uh, you had touched on Mastodon a little bit. It's crazy. That's that, when that album came out. It, it was on like fourteen different best of the year lists, like super critically acclaimed. I think the band as a whole is one of the most critically acclaimed metal bands of the last uh, while. Um, again, super talented musicians. Mm-hmm. crazy time signatures uh, i guess i would ask a question about great, mixing. great great human beings too okay great, See, great that's the stuff beings. you don't always hear you know no super super people really great people yeah they become they become good friends which is nice so with uh with rush uh so you you remix the album vapor trails i'm, I'm curious how do you, do you have constraints when you're remixing an album versus just mixing an album? Do you have to listen to the original to have a, a no, not, set not, point to move? No, from? no, I don't. I don't like to do that. I don't want to recreate. The, I would just end up trying to recreate the other mix for the most part. Um, no, in that case, so it was an interesting story. When I when I first moved back to Toronto uh, was when they were doing that work uh, for that album. That was just after Neil's family had passed away, and he'd been on his sort of two year. Um, self-reflection motorcycle trip uh, he was getting back into writing and playing and they they sort of said well you know they called me up and said will you come down and listen maybe do some work with us and I, I came down to the studio and we sat in for the day and they said you know would you would you do this with us and I, and I said well um, how long do you think you're going to want to work they're like yeah Neil's just kind of getting back in this we're probably going to be doing this for a year and I thought well I can't really commit a whole year to to one project so I said look you know um let's talk maybe later in the year and see where you're at. And maybe if you want me to dive in, that didn't happen in the end, which is fine. It, it didn't, didn't bother me at all, but, um, but they, they mixed it at the time where uh, it was right kind of in the height of the volume wars. And so it was very heavily limited, very compressed, very, um, very little dynamic in it. And a lot of the fan base weren't happy with it. The band weren't really happy with it, the mix of it. Um, and so it, it, this went on, you know, amongst nowadays uh, you have it back, back in the old days, you'd never have that kind of review of something, but social media is, is a thing and, and their fan base always wanted it to, to be remixed. So they got a hold of me and said, look, you know, ironically, I, 10 years after we didn't do this album together, would you like to remix it? So I said, sure. And, and, and I did. And, there was very little restriction. They weren't over at my studio. They just said, here, take the, take the material and have a go. So I did. And they were very happy with it at the end. I mean, we took, you know, one song and did it and they had revisions and, but just the general tone of it, they were like, yeah, this is great. We love this. So um, yeah, there was sort of all kinds of conspiracy theories online about, well, the, the recordings were bad and they had to re-record solos and re-record everything. It's not the case at all. I got the I got the material and it all sounded great. It's well recorded. It was just mixed in a way that was that was 
consummate to the time. And, you know, the, the history has shown that, that people prefer things with a little bit more breathing space, a little bit more dynamic. So I just did a mix like that. And, you know, the, the fan base, I think, is generally happy with it. Rush fans are also extremely passionate. So, you know, you're going to get feedback. I, I, got, I got probably, I'd say, 80% Rush love and, and 20% Rush hate. So it's pretty good when it comes you know, to rush and their diet. I, I thought it was a fair, I thought it was a fairly good ratio. Yeah. I saw some comments of people hating it and I saw lots of comments of people loving it. So hmm. I'll take it. 